Right, today, we embark on a journey on technological growth that has consistently and increased rapidly within a short time. I would like all of you to take a second and ask yourself, how many AI or AI-related applications and websites do you know of? Can I get a shot of hands? Uh, sorry, I would like to repeat myself. Uh, how many of you know any AI or AI-related applications or even websites? Right. So, well, it seems like the AI companies have marketing as work. Well, sort of. And now, most of us are the average consumer. Do you know how to take this to the next level? And by that, I mean professional level? And how do you benefit from this? Well, the answers are here in this forum. Today, we will get insights from our industry guests and our moderator who are experts in their fields. I would like to give a short introduction on our moderator for the day, Mr. Garyon Go, who is currently a senior lecturer in Republic Polytechnic under the Diploma of Design and User Experience. His expertise is, well, no surprise there, in UX and tech-based implementations. What you will discover about him is his hunger to know the latest in technology and especially AI. Now, what sets him apart from most people is this. He is always open to share his skills and knowledge, and he is equally open to learn. With that, I invite on stage senior lecturer, Mr. Garyon Go. Hi. Thanks, Amin. Thanks for coming here today. I think this is day two of our symbiosis, and we have students and staff here. Welcome again. And uh, the whole purpose of doing this is because AI is really the thing nowadays, right? We are all hearing AI from all corners of the news, of the media, of the internet, and we have already been using AI in some of our own curriculum, staff, our own learning, and so on. And because your batch is going to graduate soon, we also want to make sure that you know what the industry is preparing outside, what they are already using. And that's why we have four esteemed speakers from the industry today. Okay? So my job today is to introduce them and also to moderate the discussion panel later. Okay? So if you allow me, just make sure that I don't get this wrong. Let me read from here and then later maybe you can use AI to pretend as if I'm not reading. Okay, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Ku Seng Ming. He's the head of Learn AI, Senior Deputy Director at AI Singapore, which is the public innovation intermediary for AI in Singapore's ecosystem. All right, and he's also innovator of Chartered AI Engineers, and he'll be sharing with us what is AI, how AI works, and how we can all be like water. Okay, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I look forward to hearing from him. Our second speaker will be Mr. Chuck Ming Fai, a director, Solution Consulting for Southeast Asia, who has more than 20 years of experience uh, in IT, and he led a team in Adobe consulting and advising users on Adobe technology platform across digital media and digital experiences for businesses. And today he'll be sharing with us the impact of AI and how to leverage generative AI for creatives. Right. Our third speaker is uh, Mr. Mario Toon from Mighty Bear Games. He's an art production lead. And Mighty Bear Games is a game maker in Singapore that's pioneering player-first, action-packed, multiplayer fun, founded by veterans from King, Ubisoft, LucasArts, Electronic Arts, and a lot of big names in, in the game industry, where he has successfully led a team to look at, explore, and integrate AI into his workflow. And his very uh, open to share with us how we can use AI to maximize, like what he did in his uh, 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 in Mighty Bear Games, where he has actually reduced uh, his creation time of a game character, am I right? From eight weeks to two weeks, yeah. Look forward to hear you share with that. The last speaker, certainly not least, is Ms. Audrey Chia. She's the founder of Close With Copy, uh, up and rising AI influencer. The last I checked, her. LinkedIn account has 24,000 followers, 24,000 times more than mine. And uh, 
She has speak at many events online, offline, about using AI for copywriting and also for branding, and she'll she share more on how human strategy and AI execution can work for our benefit. All right, without further ado, let's welcome the first speaker. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So, my presentation titled, Be Like Water. Audio, please. Empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. So video is an analogy, not to say that saving water is bad. It is good, so do please save water. Now the point is, be like water, something that uh, uh, he said, Bruce Lee said, uh, is interpreted as when you embrace the quality of water, it's, it's more of not allowing yourself to be trapped in a certain mindset. Instead, be able to adapt to situations, be able to grow with it, to be able to change along with it. And certainly since November of 2022, a new bar of interacting with AI and machine learning has been breached with generative AI. Previously, in order to benefit from AI or realize the business value of AI, you do need a certain degree of coding capability uh, in order to get the machine learning algorithm to work on that. But since the mainstream of generative AI, uh, how you interface with uh, AI system now is very naturalized. Uh, typing, even speaking to it, has been done for a while. So I'd like to do just a simple quick recap of what is uh, the key highlights of AI and the changes or that we don't need to go deep into it because there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of explanation on it. However, whenever you look at AI, it is meant as a collective term. It's not meant as a singular piece of technology. So there is, of course, standard explanation what is AI down there. Basically, they are computer programs that uh, are alive to a certain extent, is able to adapt to user input, uh, which most of the time is data. Right? And historically, actually, there has been four different approach when it comes to AI itself. Uh, it's either human emulation or most of the time what we see here is actually data optimization itself. So you look at the different categories. Originally, when someone actually coined the term AI in, in 1953, it's all about being able to create computer programs that can think as if like a human. But most of the time these days, we look at it as being able to take the data, to think rationally, and to be able to output uh, recommendations to us. And AI itself, as I mentioned, a very umbrella term. Media has done really a disservice in, in, in making AI a magic bullet. It is not. It is multidimensional in scope. It's multidimensional in output. So there has been many different approach when it comes to the applications of AI itself. And with every areas of AI, you have different methodologies and different approaches also. And this kind of summarizes what has evolved when it comes to AI. So in the 1950s, the, the term AI is coined. And then in 1970s, 1980s, you have this term called machine learning. Fun fact, machine learning is not even a research term. It is a marketing term coined by IBM so that they can sell more of their mainframe. Of course, eventually, people embrace this thing which is called machine learning. And then back in the um, mid-2000s, early 2000s, all that, as 
a lot of the things we do in society, in businesses, digitalize. Um, many of the theoretical framework that was first postulated and proposed in the early 1950s or that get to now to have enough data sets to train. And hence, the era of deep learning come in. And deep learning itself is the ability where the algorithm can take vast amount of data to train, to generalize, and then to a certain extent be able to predict what needs to be done. And then of course now, today, you have, can I advance the slide? You have Gen AI, go back one slide please, yeah. So in 2014, um, generative AI came in. So what you know as ChatGPT, Dali E, Meet Journey, or that actually has its roots in a 2014 paper. So generative AI then become this new kids on the block. Next slide please. Okay, so we have come to sort of a pivotal point. And when you look at all the previous uh, AI advancement and all that, collectively we call it discriminative AI, uh, meaning you are looking, using AI in terms of making predictions, in terms of classifying certain data, in terms of predicting, for example, when is the next graph going to come. Generative AI itself then moved beyond analyzing the data to generating completely new sets of data from the data that is trained. So this is how you see the segment. Not to say that discriminative AI is not in use. In fact, in AI Singapore, one of our mandate is to work with industries to co-create deployable AI solution. And many of the industry use case itself doesn't just use one AI model. It's typically a collection of different classical machine learning models, even traditional rule-based system, coupled together with uh, whatever new tools that industries are now looking at. Right? So at the end of it, um, AI is actually not a magic bullet, it's just maths. And if you're curious, these are just some of the mathematical equations that describe uh, the evolvement of AI in the early 80s until now. Gradient descent, backward propagations, all that. These equations actually govern how you do uh, machine learning in order to arrive at a generalization of what the data sets pattern looks like. Root mean square error is more of analyzing the deviances. And then on the right hand side, the two uh, generative adversarial network as well as transformer base. These are the two new ones that actually power what you see right now as ChatGPT, Q, Bing.com, right? So let's focus on generative AI, the new clip on the block, okay? Um, it is the, the, the inner working of generative uh, AI uh, basically sums up to two pivotal papers, one in 2014 and then the other one in 2017. Essentially, if you look at the diagram, the taxonomy itself is an increasing sophistication of basic AI models string together to be able to produce a lot of uh, more superior prediction. In fact, for generative adversarial network, the GAN system, they actually use one AI model to train another AI model, to train until you arrive at a generalization that means that the ground truth has been achieved. Transformer-based model typically is able to take more complex input. Today, we generate both structured and unstructured data. Structured data will be what you see in Excel sheet. Unstructured data will be what you are generating right now in your tweet, in your Instagram, in videos, all that, where it's not properly structured. It can be very freeform. So, with these two advancements, all that, we now look at... Um, an era where transformer-based models are becoming very, very useful, practically. So, what is the most well-known transformer-based model or which company produced? So, is it this? No, but of course you will know it as uh, OpenAI. So, OpenAI specifically uh, produce, uh, start training their uh, GPT model way back in 2011 and a significant breakthrough was achieved with the third generation, which is how you read whenever you see the word GPT-3. Basically, it's the third generation model of their generative pre-trained transformer that they have developed. 
Today, if you use the free version of ChatGPT, it's at 3.5. And if you are an enterprise customer, you'll be looking at 4, or even higher paying customer assessing more advanced model. Right. So beside Chat, beside Chat GPT, um, another famous model that was actually launched before that is DALI E2. So what I want to describe over the next few slides is the mathematics behind it. Uh, by understanding at least how it works fundamentally, I hope you also gain to understand what are exactly the limitation and what is it that they are doing when you type in a prompt create a picture of someone skating along Republic Poly, South Canteen, something like that. Right? So, the science behind it is actually a paper called Hierarchical Text Conditional Image Generation with Clip Intent. There is a paper. And one of the things I would urge people these days is when you are interested in particular form of AI advancement or that, try not to look at media reports. Not to say that media is bad, but they only have a very limited understanding. Uh, they are not coming from the creator. The best for you to look at and go deeper into the understanding of what's happening is go and look at the research paper that is being published. Right? There is scholar.google.org, which you type in. You can search all sorts of tons of paper. And research paper typically have a summary, so very easy for you to read. So basically, this was a paper that described uh, what's happening for Dali E. And how it reads is you have a whole series of encoder decoder to do perform certain function. Take for example, we input a prompt, a teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square. And what it happened is the first model will run in order to understand what you're trying to say. Right? So large language model has been trained to understand the set of type words how they relate to each other, which means that bear and teddy is being analyzed as one input. Skateboard is another input. Times Square is another input. So you need natural language processing to process that. And then after that, they will then go through the whole diffusion pillar process where it will learn and start to understand from the training data. And then subsequently, they will assemble the image. Let's look deeper at what it's doing. So basically, it takes your input, is looking at the best caption from your input, understanding it. And what it uses is what we call the contrastive language image pre-training, or click for short. And that is a algorithm technology by OpenAI themselves. Right? And Clip has already been trained on a lot, a lot about data, things that you post, caption that you put down there. And what it does is it creates this mapping space we call representative space, so that when you input the word teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square, first of all, it dissects teddy bear, and it goes inside its own language model and understands what's teddy bear. And it also goes into its own database itself to look at images that has been labeled teddy bear. Right? So, by then, you will now understand within his computer mind, okay, this is the image of a teddy bear, so on and so forth. Right? And once it has assembled all of its images or what you wanted it to do, it will then move into the decoder stage. So in the decoder stage itself, another model actually runs, and that model is called the Glide model, or Guided Language to Image Diffusion for Generation and Editing for short. Basically, Guide will then be able to take this and then start reassembling it. So if there's ever a YouTube video which I was trying to find, it's, it's a very interesting process. It's a denoising process. You actually assemble something that is very vague. As it goes through the successive iteration, then you see the actual image being formed. Then, of course, there's another paper for that. Right? So essentially, when you put everything together, it is not reconstructing its uh, trained database. It has an idea how an image looks like, for example, the teddy bear, and it is actually generating new content, which is why we call generative AI. It's generating new content from what it has learned. And because it is generating new content, it does not copy. 
the images directly. So there has been a lot of discussion into copyright laws uh, surrounding how images are being used for training all that. The end of it is, while the output image may look similar, it's actually not a direct copy. Sometimes, of course, with very good prompting itself, you can achieve closer and closer to what another person has created. But it wasn't doing a copy and paste inside, which then, of course, opened up very interesting laws about debate about what exactly is IP. Right? So putting it all together, back to the original prompt, teddy bear, right? Clip will then uh, map your input into its own training space or representative space. Basically, then it will uh, start recoding it and then do the decoding itself to generate the image. So that's the science behind it. Okay? So if you all have a, um, a GPT app, chat GPT app already in your phone or you're using DALE E itself, you can look at how different images can be created. Right. So I created these sets of images actually uh, a couple of weeks ago as I prepared to put together this slide. Right. So I typed into Dale E to create an image of a stick. Got it right. Pretty interesting. This is what happens if you type in create an image of a chicken rice. If I tried it today just now at the canteen itself. Much better now. It, it, it's not so assembled together. It has, the, it has the chicken slice properly, also add cucumber also. So probably trained on Hainanese chicken rice set already. Yeah. Okay. Next, fish head curry. Literally fish head in a curry. Again, not too bad. When I prompted earlier, uh, it now has the fish head curry pot and then a rice to accompany it. But the fish head is still poking out quite unnaturally. Uh, except it's not so poking out so much. Lah, okay? Fish head curry. Next is frog leg porridge. Still the same. I tested it just now. Roughly the same. The, the leg seems submerged into the porridge a bit more, but it's still quite grotesque. Now this is what we call the weird phenomenon. So why is it called the WEIRD phenomenon? Because WEIRD is actually an acronym. WEIRD stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democratic Society, aka all the Angmore country. Right? So all your large language model that is currently being used to train right now is actually very quite predominantly from the Western side. So when you look at steak, no problem. You can get it right. But when you start to look at contextualizing in the local set, then it becomes difficult. Hence, a uh, accompanying trend right now with the uh, mainstream or generative AI tools or GPT tools or that is um, regional specific large language model is coming up already. And, and one of the effort AI Singapore is doing uh, is because we are a diaspora of Southeast Asia country. So AI Singapore actually has a national LLM project called Sea Lion which stands for Southeast Asia language in one network itself. So AI Singapore actually worked with uh, Philippine, Tagalog, Bahasa Malayu, Bahasa Indonesia, all that. Uh, Vietnam, not yet. Philipp um, Tagalog, a bit complex, all that. But we are uh, Thai, Thai languages also, which is very complex to do tokenization. So we are trying to create a region-specific LLM, which if you are involved in using the LLM for your own GPT tools itself, you can use the Sea Lion. So ultimately, as I describe all this, and you guys are also consuming media and talking to friends, forming your own opinion. So the current narrative right now is AI is going to take away my job. AI is, is a danger to job creation and all that. So is it a co-pilot or is it a competitor? Let's use this example, 92 minutes versus 26 seconds. A couple of years back, uh, well, before ChatGPT or that, a law firm in US uh, bought a chatbot, uh, bought an AI solution to do NDAs. So, of course, to test the NDA itself, they got their in-house lawyer to, to do it. So, what happens was, the, the AI solution actually took 26 seconds to detect the, the error in an NDA, and the lawyer on average took 92 minutes, right? 
Okay. Of course, you can have your own opinion. My own opinion is lawyer, even they can do it within 90 seconds, or they won't do it. They charge by the hour. So even they do it, they won't tell the client it can be done, you see. So one and a half hours, nice charge. But the response from the in-house lawyer is very different from what you might expect. It turns out that they hate to do NDA. It's very boring stuff. It's very basic stuff. It's a task that they rather not have. Right? So look at all the different comments here. We're talking about helping me focus on higher value added job. I can concentrate on more things that make better use of my talent. All that. And look at the last feedback from Justin Brown. Oh, good. Next time I will be better than another lawyer who don't have the chatbot, you see. Either number one, I have more time to go for my coffee break while still charging 92 minutes, or I can take on more NDA UKs because it's very simple. Right? So, the statement, I will be replaced by AI, more accurately, probably, would be I'll be replaced by someone who uses AI. And it's not just me talking about that. Jensen Huang, the famous co founder, uh, owner, the co founder of NVIDIA, also talks about how jobs are changing and rightfully people will be worrying about how their jobs will be affected. Um, naturally, it will be better that you, you, you can continuously invest in yourself to be better at your job. And if you think about it, anyone having a job consists of responsibility and tasks. What you want to do is to automate all those tasks as much as possible so that you can focus on higher value at the job. Now, of course, if your job consists of nothing but tasks or that, then of course, there might be a higher risk of automation. So, in conclusion, when we talk about AI, uh, talk about AI impacts, uh, governance, ethics, all that, we have been talking about the technology. But it's how we approach it that might be very important. So if you flip the word around, instead of AI, we should be talking about IA. We should be talking about intelligence augmentation. We should be talking about how AI can become my own personal Jarvis. Just like Tony Stark. You have a persistent digital assistant that is always helping you to do your things better. So in AI Singapore, we don't talk about upskill or reskill, we talk about plus skilling. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Ku Seng Meng. And you know what? I really agree with what he said during his speech. I really feel if there's one quote that I would like to give for this, uh, for his uh, host presentation, is that we should not let our fear consume our over over consume our curiosity, because as time goes by, a lot of things are evolving, especially in terms of AI. And now, without further ado, let's invite our second speaker up on stage, please, Mr. Chuck. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chuck Ming Fai. I'm from Adobe. Uh, and my job is to basically go around with my team and talk to customers about different types of Adobe technology. And obviously, in recent times, in the last one year or so, one of the uh, most often cited pieces of technology is generative AI, right? And how it's um, changing what a lot of people do. And of course, um, as Sing Ming has said, there's a lot of different types of AI, but I'm going to focus today on AI for creativity, especially in the areas of visual creativity, because I talk to creators a lot as part of my job, right? Since a part of Adobe's business, a large part of Adobe's business is in the area of creative software, and people are concerned about the impact on, on their jobs and on their businesses and what this means, right? So I'm going to talk a bit about that today. But I'm going to talk about it from, first from the lens of how do we deal with a new paradigm, something that's completely different from what we've experienced before. 
Um, I once worked for a boss who, uh, who was from Hollywood. So he had worked in Hollywood, he was from the media business, and he told me that you know, when something new, a disruptive technology or medium comes around, everybody will tend to look at it from the lens of what they knew before, right, and, and judge it from that perspective. So as an example, in the 1800s, um, what people did for entertainment was they went to theatres, right, and they sat down just like you, and there were people acting on stage, um, and that was all the entertainment they had, right. So what happened when moving pictures came about and motion picture cameras? What happened was that um, I, I have a video clip here of one of the first television dramas that were being broadcast, right? This was in the 1920s. And let me see if this is playing. Yeah. So as you can imagine, when cameras came about, uh, motion picture cameras, what people did was they, they took the perspective of someone sitting in a theatre and they put a camera there right in front of the stage and started filming right, what other people were doing on stage. So the, the perspective and the paradigm was that people want to sit down and watch what's happening on stage. Right? And that's exactly what they did with the camera. And it took many, many years for the industry to realize that, hey, there's a, that, there are a lot more exciting things that we can do with cameras other than just filming people on a stage. We can go out, we can film you know, trains and train robberies and things like that uh, and, and do a lot of different things. Right? And I feel that we are sort of in that kind of stage with generative AI where we're looking at it from the lens of things that we were doing before. And from there, judging that, oh, this is going to put me out of a job because it's taking away things that I was spending time doing before. So let's go back to talking about generative AI, right? And it's obviously creating a new moment, right? There's reckoning across all industries, uh, lots of statistics here, um, and to show that there's a lot of impact on businesses. But one of the important things, of course, is that um, there is one perspective of it, which is the business opportunity for businesses, but also the opportunity for these businesses to generate uh, more productivity, right, out of the workforce. Let me talk a bit about what Adobe does in generative AI, right, for the next few slides, and then I'll go back to what we're observing in terms of how creatives are responding to this, how they're using it, and what is the impact on, um, on their work. So it, about one year ago, uh, in March last year, uh, Adobe announced Adobe Firefly, which is our family of creative generative AI models. Right? So we, we announced the model, and then we put it to work in different ways. Typically, when, you, when you're thinking of um, generative AI, you're thinking of a prompt, right? And you go to a website, you type in a prompt, and it generates a, a picture, for example. So we have that. Right, we announced it, but we then put it to work in a lot of different ways that I'll, I'll talk ab about a bit later. But how do we want to differentiate generative AI? We did a lot of thinking before we released Firefly, because Adobe has been working on AI, different types of AI, uh, for more than 12 years. Right? Uh, we've been releasing AI along the way until generative AI and Firefly came along. So along the way, we've had to do a lot of thinking about what, what it means to be responsible in delivering AI capability. And the first thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to democratize creativity, right? So we want to give more capabilities to creatives, but we also want to make it easier for non-creative people to do some level of creative work, right? So that's democratizing creativity. But we also wanted to design this entire model to be ethical. And we started from the data. So one of the things that we do very differently is we only train Firefly on data uh, that we have license rights to. So we have a big database of um, images, videos, and stuff like that. So we trained it on that database, and we also trained it on 
um, public domain content, right? So we are, we are very, very sure that when you use Firefly, you are making use of data uh, that has been licensed for that purpose, right? And because of that, when we license Adobe Firefly to um, enterprise customers that we work with, let's say uh, we've been working with banks and e-commerce companies and all that, uh, we actually offer them um, indemnification, meaning that contractually we guarantee that they, they will not be sued for copyright issues, right? And Sei Ming has said that, uh, yes, there are still open copyright issues uh, around generative AI, right? I think there are still some lawsuits going on in the US where content owners are actually suing open AI and so on for um, copyright infringement for training on their data. So we don't know how that's going to pan out, right? But um, that would be an interesting space to watch. The third thing that we that we wanted to do that's very, very important is what we call integrated workflows. Because if you are a creator, uh, I think some of you are graduates who are going to graduate from here, and you might go out and you might become a creative professional. And you might be working on creating a lot of things. Uh, but you are not just going to go to a website, key something into the prompt, and generate an image. Right? You need something more than that. You'll need variations, you'll need um, to edit whatever you've created, right? So this involves workflows that go beyond just generating something using generative AI, right? And that's something that we believe very strongly. That's why we integrate our AI very strongly with Adobe's tools. So this is an example, right? This is Adobe Photoshop, right? A lot of people use Photoshop, and what we've done is we've integrated AI into it such that um, you make use of generative AI and Adobe Firefly to edit stuff and create stuff and, uh, and create stuff within the image, right? So that's an example of how we use generative AI, right? Another example, um, which is generative expand, right? So we have generative fill, generative expand. Uh, a lot of times you have an image, you want to be able to expand it, um, but to get, have the AI help you to imagine what goes beyond the borders of the original picture that you had. Right. So we've been putting a lot of this capability into different parts of our tools and the workflows around it. Right. And we didn't stop at images. So for example, one of the things we've, create, we've, we've rolled out with the, the Firefly model is text to vector, where with a prompt, you're actually creating vector graphics right, and not just images. Generative match. Uh, this is one where we have a lot of customers that make use of this, right? Retail customers, uh, toy manufacturers, and what they want to do is to be able to have images, but matching the style of a particular uh, brand image that they may have. Sketch to image, right? Create, using a sketch and um, creating an image out of there. So some of these are, are still in the development phase, uh, but we are slowly developing uh, and releasing these models one by one. So text to material is, is the last example I have here where in 3D, you can actually use, uh, generate materials to wrap around a 3D model that you have. So that's what we've been doing in terms of the technology. And one of the things that we did in the early days when we started uh, releasing generative AI is we did a study, sort of like a focus group. We, we brought different creators together and allowed them to use different types of generative AI models, not just Adobe, to actually do their work. And we started observing them. And then we interviewed them to ask them, how does this work for you, right? What about generative AI works for you? And what about generative AI doesn't work? And here are a few things that, that work for them. For these creators, I think generative AI works very well as a catalyst at the start of the project because you have the blank page, right? And you're trying to think of ideas. So it helps with the ideation process. You can very quickly type different things into a prompt, come up with, with different um, images and see more or less how it looks. And to them, that was a big time saver. 
visualizing options. If I, if I have two or three ideas in my head, I want to quickly compare them and see which one has more possibilities. I think that for them worked very well, especially in the areas of advertising, right, where they are, they are trying to come up with options uh, when, when, when they're creating designs for, for print ads, uh, playing around with placement of objects and so on. Trying out variations is actually a big one for some of the companies out there like toy manufacturers, uh, apparel manufacturers, retailers, where they have something, let's say a toy or a t-shirt or a, a pair of sneakers, and they need to generate 1,000 variations of images for where their sneakers are, right? And this is something that used to take a lot of time, right? But generative AI now, it can be automated and done very, very quickly. So this is something that, that creators find very useful. And you may think, okay, this takes a away a lot of work from the creator, doesn't it? Uh, but it's actually a lot of drudge work for them, right? It's not something that they may enjoy, right? Taking a pair of sneakers and having to generate that pair of sneakers against 1,000 background images, right? And having to do it slowly by hand. So this was something that they, they really appreciated. And what these creators said works for them is when they keep their prompts simple or they grind, they just keep refining that prompt and refining that prompt and refining that prompt until they get what they want or, or they get lucky, right? So I'm sure if you've tried um, using generative AI and generating images from there, you've experienced some of these. But these creators then brought up two very, very important obstacles um, that they say kind of slowed them down and kept them from um, delivering what they needed to deliver. The first one is creative challenges. I think, especially with professional creatives, they need very, very detailed control over their work. Right? Even pixel-level control sometimes, if you're talking about digital imaging. And many of them felt that generative AI did not give them that level of control. They were not able to control down to the finest detail how that image worked or how that image looked. Um, they would keep trying to refine the prompt and, and all that, but it, it, would, it, it was actually quite backbreaking for them if they wanted that level of creative control. And the other one that I've alluded to is what we call user interaction challenges. Because after a while, everybody felt that, okay, the only way I can get something is go to a website, type something into a prompt, and get something out of there. But um, like what I showed earlier, what if, I want, if I'm working inside Photoshop, if I'm working inside another piece of software, and I want this to be part of my workflow, right? If I have a workflow that encompasses several different types of software, uh, how do I actually get an efficient workflow rather than always going back to my browser and a prompt just to get something right? So those were some of the obstacles that they, they faced. And this right now is a state, I think, of what, how creators are looking at generative AI. Um, so apologies for some of the placement of the, of the, of the text. Uh, this slide is actually from a McKinsey study that shows um, the impact of generative AI on automation. Right? And the text might be a bit small, but basically what it shows is for every type of profession, you will see that there are kind of three dots, right? Or rather two dots and a number in the middle, right? And the dot on your left, the gray dot, is the, is the, the kind of automation impact they can get without generative AI, right? And then the blue dot is the, the automation that they can get with generative AI. So the difference in between then is the impact of generative AI. And I've sort of circled out creative and arts management, and the impact of generative AI is about a 20% increase in productivity. So one of the first points I wanted to make is treat generative AI as an accelerant, right? Not just a disruption, but an accelerant that helps you to do your work a lot faster. The other point I wanted to make is um, 
what this has an impact on, especially for you, those of you who are graduating, you're going to go out to work, you are going to become um, um, professionals, right? And you might be worried about, okay, what kind of skills should I be looking at adopting, right? Or what kind of skills should I acquire to make sure that I get better in my job, that I will not be just replaced by AI. So, um, I did a presentation called The Future of Work some time ago, and this slide is actually from that uh, presentation. Uh, it's actually part of a, a study that we did with an organization on the future of work going out 15 years in the Asia-Pacific region. Right? And there's lots of statistics in there, but I pulled out this slide specifically because um, the research shows that these are the capabilities that are most valuable in an era going 10, 15 years out when AI is going to augment a lot and disrupt a lot of what we do, right? And even replace certain jobs, right? But within that, these are the capabilities that you really should be looking at acquiring, right? Starting from the bottom and going to the top where the ones at the top are, of course, the most important capabilities. So starting at the bottom, digital capabilities, um, data, uh, figuring out how to solve problems with data, how to research, how to visualize and tell stories, etc. Leadership capabilities, learning about how to lead teams, uh, how to engage people, how to build culture, how to have a direction and purpose in what you do, and so on. And then finally, uh, the, the top two levels, the second one is outcome capabilities that will really differentiate us um, from a machine, right? Do we have the ability to orient ourselves to a certain results um, and communicate and collaborate with people? And finally, core capabilities, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, achievement focus. Those are the skills you should look at acquiring and differentiating yourself. Um, this one is... Uh, from another study that we did uh, with World Economic Forum. And we found that uh, employers seek communication and creativity in 2 million job postings. So we studied 2 million job postings. The top things that employers look for, communication and creativity, yet most resumes do not even list this as a skill. Right? So that's very important. So the generative AI opportunity in education then is to ensure that um, students learn new forms of literacy, uh, they learn experientially, so introducing more experiential learning. And of course, uh, another buzz term that we hear a lot now is lifelong learning. That's very important for all of us. So what do we need to learn, right, given the, the current state of the technology? I'd say, how do we make that technology work for us? Right? So learn prompt engineering and, and whatever is needed to ensure that you know how to make use of this technology. Figure out how to pair your human ingenuity uh, and augment it with technology. I think I was speaking to some of the, the, the other speakers uh, earlier, and I find that there's a common theme, which is that um, even with generative AI, we need human ingenuity, right? because... Um, if you think of an advertising campaign, for example, generative AI is not going to, in its current state of the technology, um, be able to figure out what's the strategic impact of this, of this campaign, right? What is the strategy of this campaign? What are you aiming to achieve? Um, who are your audience, right? So you need the human ingenuity for that, but then hopefully the technology comes in and helps you to um, do a lot of work underneath it. AI ethics, uh, I've not been able to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but there are a lot of issues around this uh, fairness, bias, um, especially if you're generating images, right? Um, what's the impact of AI on stakeholders? How do you do governance, right? If you're in a large organization, uh, how do you make sure that the AI you're using is producing results that will not get you into trouble or get the organization into trouble? How do you deal with data privacy and copyright issues? Um, another very last topic that's very important, content authenticity. 
this is a year when supposedly 50% of the Earth's population uh, are going to vote in an election somewhere or other on the planet. Right? So content authenticity uh, is a very critical topic, uh, being able to recognize what is authentic and what is not, and critical thinking about what that piece of content is trying to tell us. Right? So those are some of the things we need to learn. Um, I will end with a quote from my CEO, Mr. Shantanu Narayan. Uh, he was interviewed on uh, Washington Post, I think, uh, just one or two days ago, and he was asked uh, what he would tell young creatives today. And this is what he said, right, that he would tell young creatives today, if you want to be the creative in the creative field, why not equip yourself with everything that's out there that enables you to be a better creative? Um, understand the breadth of what you can do with technology. Understand new mediums. Uh, understand the different places where people are going to go to consume content and consume your content. Um, and any kind of information that you acquire is only going to make you a better creative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chuck. And yeah, I think I really like the wonderful quote uh, from the CEO of Adobe uh, that talks about how we ourselves can utilize the things that we have right now, AI, to become our co-pilot or even uh, to assist us in our works. Right? So now let's invite our third speaker, Mr. Mario Toon, up on stage for his presentation. Hello. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today as I share the journey of incorporating AI into our game art development pipelines and how AI has changed the way the art team at Mighty Bear Games work. So, uh, let me see if this is working. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, my name is Mario. So uh, I'm an art production lead at Mighty Bear Games. Basically, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is to establish uh, art pipelines, overseeing tool development uh, within our studio, leading the art production team uh, from concept all the way to implementation, making sure that all the assets that we get into the game is of the highest quality possible, meeting the technical requirements and the design uh, requirements that we need for our products. I'm also one of the guys championing the AI, generative AI efforts uh, in our company. Uh, a lot of my efforts are focused on the 2D, uh, sorry, on the 3D R&D parts and talking to external partners uh, for potential coll collaboration. I've been in the industry for about 15 years so far, making games. Started off my career as a QA tester and uh, I was also uh, an NYP lecturer before uh, joining Mighty Bear Games. So, um, Mighty Bear Games is not a big company, um, but we are most likely known for uh, Butter Royale. If I can click on it. Yeah, Butter Royale. Uh, this is uh, the first non violent Battle Royale game developed for Apple Arcade. We also uh, worked with Disney and Pixar on Disney Melee Mania, also on Apple Arcade. So, this was actually not sure why it's not showing up. Okay, it's taking a while to load. So this was the reason why I chose to leave uh, education to go back into the industry because I wasn't going to give up on working on uh, such a cool uh, product. But uh, one of the things that the art team was really proud of uh, while working on this project was that we were able to integrate 16 different IPs from Disney and Pixar uh, into the game, each with their own guidelines and approval processes. So both of these games are available on Apple Arcade on uh, compatible platforms. Uh, and more recently, we started working on Mighty Action Heroes, uh, our latest project. It's a Web3 uh, competitive shooter. Um, we saw the opportunities in the Web3 space to bring benefits of on-chain collectibles to Web2 gaming. So this game is free to play. Uh, you don't need to interact with on-chain items uh, if you choose not to. Um, and it's now available on Android and web, web browser. And we will be launching on iOS very, very soon. 
So this is how the game looks like. Yeah. So last year, uh, much to our surprise, uh, we were awarded best mobile game of the year uh, by Game 3 Awards. Um, pretty cool, uh, especially since the game only launched uh, later last year. And um, earlier this year, we released Season 2 of uh, Mighty Action Heroes. And this was a huge milestone for us because it helped us validate the efforts that we have put into generative AI in uh, our projects. So throughout our studio, uh, we've come to embrace how generative AI can help us get things done faster and at a higher quality. On the art side, we are mostly focused on uh, redeveloping our pipelines from concept to 3D, rigging and animation, tooling and scripting, and even for marketing art. So specifically for the concept phase, if I can scroll down. Ah, uh, okay, yes. So for the concept phase, uh, specifically for, for this piece of work over here, um, it took me, myself, uh, and our concept artists about one month to go through the process of ideation, uh, concepting, uh, going to details, um, a lot of research to develop this uh, mock-up over here in 3D in Maya, if it can open up. Yeah, yeah. So from from the first image to to the fifth image over here, it took us about one month to get everything ready to pitch to our stakeholders and get the approval. Back in the day, two years ago, this made sense for game production. It makes perfect sense because of all the work that we've, we had to put into. But in the days of exploring AI, we realized that all we needed was just a good idea, solid alignment in the vision within the team to create an image that looks like this. Is it opening up? Yes. It basically encompasses all the ideas that we wanted to, definitely less uh, scrappy than what we had in the initial mock-up, and it took us only five minutes to achieve, and even shorter time to get approved from our stakeholders. None of the work over here is done by us, and it will never go into the game, but it helps us deliver the idea of what we want to do for the game itself. We also looked into how we can use uh, AI to uh, create UI mockups, fine tuning multiple models to help us achieve the look and feel that we are looking for so that we could bash them together, bash the different art pieces together to give our stakeholders, non-visual stakeholders, non-creative stakeholders, a better sense of what we are working towards. So this was a very, very useful, uh, you know, even working with engineers, working with uh, programmers on how we want the UI to set up in the game. But before we were able to achieve all of this, we had to figure out where to start. And we decided that we wanted to fine tune two models as a proof of concept that this is something that was very, very possible. And the first model, we call it Lone Wolf V1, so this character's working title was Lone Wolf at the time. And it's a character model. Basically, our intention is to feed in um, as much as possible uh, all the different angles and all the different poses of this specific character to create um, different variations of this. From you know this character holding a gun to this character saluting or doing something else that we've never done before in our game. So, we got to a point where we thought it was okay. Um, it's not fantastic, admittedly, right? Um, the proportion is a bit off from what you see above. Um, you still get the typical issues like messed up AI fingers. Um, and there were also, if you look at it closely, there were still a lot of things that were just all over the place and still completely unusable, but we could identify the potential. And this took us about, 
I believe, three months to get here. And within that three months was a lot more painful <laughs> and also hilarious. Can I scroll? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was quite funny for us. Um, imagine working with, with external partners. We had external partners to help us build these data sets and you know, with all the promises of, oh, you know, AI is going to help us get the work done. Fantastic. Um, this was what was presented to us in the first few passes, and it was, I got the work done. That's cool, right? What do you think? And we were like, yeah, definitely not. This is not anything usable by any measure for us. But, you know, um, as, as we continue training, as we continue learning from the mistakes that we've made through training the different models um, with learn how to build better data sets to come out with uh, much better outcomes. So this character here, uh, no longer uh, Lone Wolf, is called Silver Shah, uh, who is available in our latest uh, season. Um, we've tried using the latest model to generate a few images of this character. A lot better, but still very inconsistent. Uh, the quality of the render, the shininess, the kind of uh, surface detail that we are looking for is getting very, very close. We are almost there. But again, you know, still a lot of work for us to do. And at the same time, we are still stumbling, making mistakes. But we've also learned that you know, it's really, really important to have a good laugh and enjoying the process while we continue our journey into figuring out how to use AI. The second model that we have, our, where we used uh, in our proof of concept was called the style model. Basically, this model is to help us figure out how can we use AI to build more of what we don't have based on what we already have in the game itself. So we are hoping that this style can help us generate new weapons, new props, and everything in between for the game only using the data that we have from the game itself. So again, the outcome was okay, um, not fantastic. But what was nice about this is that this model could be creative with huge quotation marks. Okay? Things like produce, producing variations. One of the things that it was exceptionally helpful was to help us expand our ideation processes, like we could uh, key in a prompt like Jeep, and it could you know, churn out a few variations for us. And from there, we can always hand it off to our 3D team to create the final uh, 3D model for in-game use. And with the POCs done, you know, we were a lot more confident on what we could do, so we tried to plug these tools straight into our concept pipelines to see what we could get. Initially, uh, we were thinking of sketch to previous, so you know, this worked great using our style model. Things that are, you know, really mundane, tedious work, uncreative work even, like adding colors to an existing sketch. Used to take maybe like two minutes for an artist to do by hand, but now we could use generative AI, key in the prompts that we want, tell it exactly the colors that we want to use, and we could get something in less than 20 seconds. The difference in the time uh, done by hand and uh, done using AI may not be significant, but imagine, you know, in production at scale, you have 10 sketches to add colors to, and each of these sketches, you need 10 different color variations just to get an approval from your stakeholders. The amount of time just adds up. We also tried to push, you know, adding volume to flat colors, flat sketches, just so that we can give our stakeholders a better understanding of how the characters will look like in game. You know, again, these are just 2D images. We won't be able to use this for in game, but it was a good sense uh, for our stakeholders to understand, hey, you know, this is how it's gonna look like with volume. This is how the highlights are gonna hit the characters on the hair and the shirts and whatever. What kind of materials are being used for each of these parts of the character? And we realized that sometimes with AI, we don't need to get super high quality, super high fidelity renders. We can get AI to get the bulk of the work done, you know, just by adding a bit of shading here and there. 
and the artist can always get hands-on to get the artwork through to the final mount. And that became our approach to implementing AI into the rest of our pipeline. So we are not, again, we're not expecting AI to get us from zero to 100, but instead eliminating the most painful processes of our art development. For example, uh, some of these characters are unreleased yet uh, for our games, but at the top, uh, what you see are six final color variations that were pitched to our stakeholders for approvals. What you see is six, but our concept artist, Venti, was able to generate 60 different color variations based on her expertise, based on her understanding of color theory, on what would work best for this character. Then, as a team, we trimmed it down to this list over here, then showcased it to our stakeholders, and the outcome was very, very positive. Yeah, we also started um, generating uh, explore other ways of generating different ideas, such as painting over an existing character just to create new silhouettes and you know, throwing it into the AI process again to see if we can generate new ideas from there. So something like this would have taken Venti maybe a couple weeks to get done, 60 different color variations, right? But the 60 that she did, about one and a half days, and we got approved really quickly also. A lot of the output is still all over the place, right? We always want to show the cool stuff, the finished, polished stuff. But sometimes we get something interesting enough for us to consider the possibilities. It's the same thing for our marketing art. So we use our style, uh, style model okay, and figure out how we can apply these kind of things for non-in-game use. So marketing art was a good place to try it out using generative AI to just cut out mundane uh, processes so that we can maximize the current capabilities of our team members to create assets really quick. So, for example, for these two images over here, typically it would take one full day for, for an artist to create, but we already have an idea. We know it's Halloween, we know we need pumpkins in the style of our game. We have a style model, we key in the prompts, and we got it done in a fraction of the time. That was when we realized that Gen AI is not a solution, but more of a tooling pipeline. It can help us get certain things done within our processes, but we need to understand what are the biggest pain points in our pipelines and address them very, very specifically. So for example, for this image over here on the left side, um, it's a sticker for Telegram for Discord for our social media users, right? But let's say tomorrow, New York Times Square wants to put this on one of their buildings, slap it on 50 stories tall. We can use AI to just upscale the image and it'll be ready. Instead of getting an artist opening up a Photoshop file, 50 million by 50 million pixels and you know, slowly scratch through and you know, refining the, the blurry details over there. And in terms of tooling, we went a further step by tapping on the capabilities of our artists. A lot of our artists on the team, fortunately, are um, well-versed in Python. So why not put it into good use? And sometimes it does pay off to be a little lazy, in a good way, of course. So our 3D animator, Queenie, uh, was tasked to skin eight characters all at one go. You know, which would have taken her weeks. Maybe one character would be like a couple days, three to four days even. You know, but she suggested to prioritize some of that time allocated for that task to do some R&D and see if we can come up with a better solution. And the outcome over here is an auto-rig tool built using ChatGPT that could apply, update, test rigs for all our characters in the game, even characters that we haven't created before. So with 20 characters in the game right now, the impact of delaying that initial rigging task at the beginning has paid off immensely. immensely. And with that success, we've decided to build a suite of tools for Mighty Action Heroes called the Hero Generator that would allow artists, 3D artists, animators, uh, even technical artists, to prepare different versions of the same character for in-game in implementation. 
And this was all possible because she wasn't afraid that AI would take over her job. AI, yes, did take over part of her job, but the part that was taken away gave her time to work on achieving even greater outcomes for us. And one of these greater outcomes is introducing comfy, workflow, comfy UI workflow development. So this is something that's still in the really early stages uh, uh, in our pipeline. And we've partnered up with an expert to develop more advanced, more complex workflows to expand the use of uh, AI to our different art production disciplines. Hopefully one day, even 3D. And speaking of which, we have dabbled into 3D uh, using AI. And initially, you know, we always want to start simple, we want to start easy. So we went with something that was very geometric, a simple supply crate, a loop crate that you know, is found in most games, cube-like with small details. The outcome was, again, okay, but not in any measure that we would be comfortable using in-game. The topology, the topology is wonky, the texture projection is super messed up. Um, it's, it's not efficient for, to, for us to use this kind of assets in the game. So we, we still decided that this was a huge opportunity for us and there was a lot of potential for us to explore even more and we just jumped into the deep end of the pool by using things that are a lot more complex like characters. So uh, initially we tried putting, uh, inputting single image outputs into our uh, into our tool, okay, and again, the outcome was okay. Initially, it was a lumpy mess, you know, we, we couldn't even tell where's the front of the head to the back, or, you know, if that's a hand or a leg, are the fingers there? But if, eventually, we got to a point where we can produce fairly decent results over here. Um, still not usable in game, again, we are looking at, you know, getting maybe about 20 to 50% of the work done, and our artists will have to go in hands-on and get it over the finish line. But the fact is we could create consistent outputs. So with that learning, we decided, okay, with a single image output, we could get fairly decent results. What about something like a character turnaround? And this is something that we already have to do for our production purposes anyway. Our concept artists will have to do the front view, side view, back view of the characters so that the 3D artists can understand how it looks like from all the different angles and create it, right? So we fed all the different angles into our tool. Oh, I think the mouse is constantly going to sleep. Okay, yeah. And this was the outcome that we got. This was one of the most recent outcomes that we got. To the untrained eye, yes, this is freaking amazing, right? But for us, it's not good enough. If you scrutinize it, the proportions are still a little off. Um, there's still a lot of um, issues here and there that you know, uh, we'll have to go in and edit. But the amount of time to take to create one character went from five days to about one and a half days. Again, a lot of time saved, right? We are looking at productivity increase of about 80% over here. But again, the artist will have to go in and get the final 20% done. We still had to unwrap the character model by hand. Um, and this is how the final character looks like. And for in-game users, uh, we needed to create LODs, uh, level of details, so that the, the 3D models that we put into the game are performant and it can run smoothly in the game. So in the previous model that you saw, that was about 20,000 polys, 20,000 tries. Um, but for the assets that you need to put into the game, it's about between 4,500 to about 2,000. So to crunch the amount of polygons by hand, again, it's a lot of work. It's creative, it's uncreative, it's mundane, it's very, very tedious, and it takes a lot of time. 
why not try using AI to do it? Again, we're not looking for a polished outcome at the end. If it can help us crunch 50% of the polygons that we don't need, that is already a win for us. And right now, that is where we are at. We can crunch it down to about 75%. So with about 15, 20,000 polygons, it's about 5,000. But from there, we still need to polish up the asset so that it looks good in game. So the big question is, what is the actual ROI for us to use generative AI in the process of creating assets for Mighty Action Heroes? To put that into context, this is what one character means. It's a little small, but we have one concept, one final approved concept of the character, but the output of the character is two real-time 3D models in the game and countless amounts of 2D assets like hero portraits, NFT icons, marketing renders, and something like this used to take us about eight man weeks to get done. Right now, we're at a place where we can comfortably say that we take only about three man weeks, but the goal is to get it down to less than two. I don't think we are, that, we are there yet, but with enough work put into figuring out how to optimize, how to address additional pain points or uh, leftover pain points in our pipelines, we can just trim things here and there and make it happen. So in summary, generative AI has helped us achieve faster turnaround times uh, or more ideas, stakeholders, internally in the art team like myself, or even non-artistic ones like you know, our production manager um, can convey their vision along with requirements a lot better. And once the art direction is approved, uh, the shortened turnaround times on actual designs will allow us to iterate more and quicker in both our 2D and 3D processes and focus on what is really important for us to achieve better final outcomes. And that is where the, creati the creativity must happen. A lot, of times, a lot of time has also been saved in back and forth approval processes uh, with the stakeholders. So the aim and the goal here for Mighty Bear Games has always been to increase productivity at scale and not about cutting jobs. But sometimes it may be uncomfortable you know, thinking that, why am I trying to develop a tool that is preventing me from doing what I typically do, typically do at work on a daily basis. But with that part of the work taken out, it allows us to do even better, even more important things that helps the company, helps the product achieve better outcomes. From an art team's perspective, AI is a perfect tool, right? Very rough around the edges still, but a perfect tool for us to upskill for us to uh, figure out, find information, increase productivity, and even hone artistic ability. There have been a lot of technical challenges that the art team, you know, being not as technical, um, we couldn't achieve all of them, right? But now it's a lot less daunting. Some of the art team members have also started the transition into becoming technical artists. A lot of the focus on skills for artists, for hands-on artists, uh, will change from the technical ability to click a mouse, to move vertices, to move you know, images on a canvas, to true artistic funda fundamental abilities like color theory, composition, anatomy, topology, along with effective communication skills to achieve truly good art for production purposes. And most importantly, Anyone can come up with ideas, supporting visuals, and not just art team. So in any instances where the art team is not equipped to achieve the amount of work that we need to do, it's going to be a lot easier for us to onboard people from other disciplines, from other departments, to just run through the softwares, go through the pipeline, and get things done. Even if the work is not at a quality that we typically look for within the art team, we can always get an artist to assist in the polish and uh, for the final implementation uh, into the game. 
And from my perspective as a former educator, this presents the most exciting challenge ever in my career. Um, prospective artists like yourselves today, graduates, um, can now learn more, you can learn a lot faster. Um, there's a different set of technical tools and skills that are available now for you guys to achieve better, faster outcomes. But, of course, we have to acknowledge that there's still a lot of difficult conversations that needs to be had on how to approach this topic, how to regulate, regulate the use of generative AI from an ethics and morals perspective, to appeal to a wider uptake uh, by the general audience. But if anything, we have proven that it's possible to do it in an ethical way without stealing art or sac sacrificing jobs. All the data that we are using right now are based on the work that we have done in-house. We are not taking work that you know, is available on ArtStation or on any other um, creative platforms. Everything was the hard work of the team to create all the data sets and to, the uh, to create the final output. So one thing I hope everyone can remember here okay, is that whether we like it or not, the next round of industrial revolution is already upon us. And just like the artisans of the past, many of them were against it when machinery introduced mass production. But given time and dedication, this will mean better art for better games made by better artists and better game developers. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, please do reach out if uh, you are interested to learn more. I'm more than happy to connect and share. Uh, and if we have time later, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mario Toon. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, I really love this word so much which is work efficiency. And why is that so? I feel that sometimes we as creative people, we have many tight deadlines for some of our multiple projects that we are in. And this presentation that is made by Mr. Mario Toon shows that it is possible for us to use this as a way to pitch ideas or for mock-ups or reference it doesn't mean that it has to be something of an original work because in the end, it's all about human genuity, which is, comes from us. So, without further ado, let's invite our last speaker, Ms. Audrey Chia, up on stage for her presentation, please. Thank you so much. So, for those of you who are still here, thank you so much for being here. And those of you who are on Zoom, thank you for being with us. I think it has been a really incredible session where we have learned so much from all the other speakers. And for my workshop, I want to teach you really how you can leverage AI in marketing. Whatever I want to share with you today is how you can actually use AI in your day-to-day -day and your everyday workflows. So, a little bit more about myself. Um, my name is Audrey Chia, and I'm the founder of Close With Copy. So I run a hybrid human AI copywriting consultancy. Now, I know that's a mouthful, and when I talk to most people, they're like, a what? Yes, a hybrid human AI copywriting consultancy. So I started off as a copywriter, I launched my own consultancy, and then AI came along. And I was one of those people who would think, is my job going to be taken? Am I going to be replaced, right? So, of course, I understand the fears that a lot of writers and creatives have out there. So, I've worked with brands like Nike, Ikea, and Samsung all the way to startups, SMEs, and small businesses. So, I know the challenges that each brand has when they want to scale. And how can every brand use AI, right? You're always asking yourself, is AI just a hype? Can I actually use it? The answer is, yes, you can. So, these are the questions that I first had when I first started. Do I really have to use AI? Will it take over my job? Where do I even begin? Right, big, big questions. And if you are one of them, I want to say, don't panic, okay? I actually taught my mom how to use ChatGBT, and this is an actual screenshot from our WhatsApp conversation. She says, haha, I love ChatGPT. <laughs> so this morning, I was just working on my um, work, right? And then I was like, mom, I want to tell you something. And she was talking. And I thought that she was talking to me, 
but she was talking to ChatGPT on her phone. So she was using her voice control function on ChatGPT and just talking to it and asking for advice. Um, yeah, my mom is awesome and I love her for that. So if you are stressed out, if you are thinking, oh, it's all AI is just a hype, or if you're thinking, I can't do it, my mom can do it, and so can you. Don't quote me on that. Okay, so let's play a little game before we dive into the actionable insights, right? I want your help to tell me which of these posts is 100% AI generated, okay? Take a careful look, right? I'm going to read out post A to you, which says, Get ready to unleash your ultimate aura from inside out. The new SK2 Gen Optics Ultra Aura Essence is made with SK2's rare and exclusive blend of ingredients, unlocking your true aura. All right, this is post A. Now I'm going to read post B, and you're going to tell me which of this post is 100% AI generated, right? So post B says, Transform your skin from within. The new SK2 Gen Optics penetrates deep to target spots, revealing a brighter, more luminous you. All right, so can I take a vote right now? Who thinks A is AI generated? Raise your hands. Who thinks A is AI generated? All right, I see a couple of hands there. All right, maybe like one third of you. Okay, now who thinks B is AI generated? Raise your hands, please. I see a couple of hands there. All right, who thinks they are both AI generated? All right, there's someone in the back. All right, another one there. <laughs> And the answer is B. So the post B, right, that you see right here, both visuals and copy is 100% AI generated. And this was at the beginning of AI when I was just using ChatGPT3 and I was using another tool called Pebbly. So super cool stuff. Now, let's take a look at the true potential of AI right now, right? So that was just a little quiz, but things that you can actually do with AI right now today. This, this ads are a hundred percent generated by AI. Um, I did it in collaboration with Eller. He is an AI graphic designer, and we wanted to push the limits of what we could achieve. These two images are generated by Mid Journey Six, and we wanted to create a campaign for a Mac that talks about raw beauty, right? And raw beauty can come in so many forms, even in AI's imperfection. You can also actually create food. And I know just now we had some examples of the weird chicken rice. But if you take a look here, you can see that um, uh, this, is actually, this is actually Google's new uh, launch, right? And you can see that the visuals generated by it are superb. I did it with Tianyu, who created a whole series of Singaporean food from chili crab all the way to our satay and even the roti prata. The roti prata still needs a bit of work, but I think it's pretty good for now. So next, we also have architecture. I did this in collaboration with Jennifer. Um, everything here from the copy to visuals are AI generated. So we didn't just prompt and say, can you, you know, create an architecture magazine, right? What we did was to have a vision in mind and then prompt for it. If you read the copy here, it is also written in a way that sounds like an architecture magazine. It's not written in a fashion way. It's not written in an editorial way. It's written for architecture and you can prompt for that. Now, landing pages. This is one of my favorite things, and this is also created by AI. It's created in five minutes um, using a prompt on ChatGPT and a tool called Framer. So this is only V1 of the landing page, and there is so much to be done. So I want to tell you that the future of AI and human is hybrid, actually, and you might have already guessed that. AI without human strategy is pointless. If you use AI to generate content, all you're going to get right is very robotic sounding words. You're going to see things like attention founders, or it is just the beginning, or revolutionary, or supercharging, right? And you will see those words a lot when it comes to AI content. But when you combine it with human strategy, and when you combine it with editing your copy, you will get quality results in so much shorter amount of time. So there are three steps to it, right? You have the human strategy. We start off with the human level, 
thinking. This is where you leverage high-level thinking and brand expertise in understanding things like your key consumer insights, your value proposition, where does your brand sit in the market, and then you have AI execution, where you harness the power of AI to execute on the strategies that you already have developed. Then you can use it to supercharge your copywriting skills. And finally, you have a seamless integration, where you integrate AI into your existing workflows. And this has saved me so much time. I used to take about three weeks to build landing pages, and right now, I take three days. Um, so that is the kind of time savings that you can expect if you know how to leverage it well. So that is a big if. So it all starts with a little Mr. Bean's curiosity, right? <laughs> you got to be able to say, I'm going to have fun. I can make a fool of myself. It's fine if I don't get the right results. But you have to first say, I'm going to give it a shot and I'm curious to try. So how do you actually use AI skillfully, right? So I'm just going to ask another question here. Who here uses ChatGPT frequently? Raise your hands. All right, we have the whole row there. Amazing, I see you. Okay, Ch ChatGPT users. Yeah, so the whole goal, right, is to figure out how do I get it to sound the way I want it to sound? How do I get it to create the output that I'm looking for without having to prompt a hundred times? Because that can be extremely frustrating. I understand. I've been through that myself. And in the beginning, I was so frustrated. I was like, why don't I just write this line by myself? It's so much faster. But when you figure out the workflow, and when you crack that full funnel, you can repeat the same process over and over again, and that's when you actually reap the rewards. So for those of you who are not familiar with ChatGPT, the first thing you should do is to get it on your phone. The reason why I say that is because you can use it every single day. So what I do is I switch on ChatGPT on my phone, I toggle on the sound function, and I just talk to it. I'll be like, hey, I need some ideas. What do you think about this? So you might look a bit like a mad person, but it's fine, okay? <laughs> you still get really, really good results, right? So if you're thinking, Audrey, I want to start. Like, how? how? Like, what do I say to chat GPT? Do I just say good morning? Um, there are actually five steps to a better prompt. It's not the perfect prompt, but these are your foundational building blocks. So the first thing you need is your role. You need ChatGPT to know what is the role you want it to be. So it can be an experienced copywriter, it could be a brand strategist, it could be an audience researcher, or it could even be, and this is one you want to take note of, a sophisticated templatization algorithm. The reason why I say this is because when you start to identify patterns and trends, you can fully maximize AI to your advantage, right? So that is the role. Now, the second thing is your context. ChatGPT needs to know what you are and what you want to work on. So I'm telling it, hey, this is what you need to know about me, right? I'm a copywriter. I run a AI human copywriting consultancy. Um, this is my target audience, CEOs and CMOs of company sizes XYZ. These are their fears. These are their desires. This is my unique selling point. Please remember all this, right? So the more information you give it, the more context you give it, the better it actually gets, right? And of course, the third thing, your target audience. Today, I'm speaking to you, right? But when I'm writing something, I could be writing for a finance executive. So I need to include my target audience in the chat GPT building blocks. Next, tone of voice. Nike has a tone of voice, Ikea has a tone of voice, I have my own tone of voice, and we all sound different, right? So when you are building the ChatGPT building blocks, you need to specify what exactly you want ChatGPT to sound like. And finally, the output. Now, this is one tip that I have, right? Instead of saying, hey, ChatGPT, can you write an ad for me? I will say, can you write an ad with a headline of six words, a subheadline of seven words, and three bullet points? The more specific you are in the output, the better the results. Trust me, when you try this, I think it will change your life. So I'm just going to show you a super quick example of how does it actually happen, right? And we're going to talk about my favorite thing, landing pages. Now, some people, they collect books. Some people collect shoes. Some people collect cars card games, I collect landing pages. I know, I'm a, I'm a nerd. So <laughs> I love landing pages. I study them rigorously. I have to figure out what makes a landing page convert. 
And coming back to the same model, right? How do I blend human strategy with AI execution? And how do I prompt for a good landing page? This is where the secret sauce happens. This is the magic behind the scenes. So I need to first decide what kind of landing page do I want to create. If it's a sales page, you probably want to write like a salesperson and say, if you don't buy this thing today, you will regret it for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> so that is the sales page. If you are writing for a brand page, you should be more motivational, inspiring, tell them about your story, give them a feeling, right? That is a brand page. But if you're writing for a conversion page, you need to tap on audience insights and turn them into messaging for your audience. So in this case, let's talk about the conversion landing page, right? And then I need to think what makes a good conversion landing page. So I'll break it down into copy, structure, and the different elements. So only when I break it down into sections, then I can start prompting for the copy. So this is a basic prompt. Most people would say, um, hey, chat GPT, write a landing page for my company versus something that's a little bit more complex but with a lot more thought, right? In this case, I'm saying you are an expert conversion copywriter who specializes in crafting websites that convert. Please craft a website for my company. Here are some guidelines to follow. Now I'm giving it a huge chunk of context. This is my company name, my descriptor, what we do, target audience, tone of voice, call to action, and then this is where the magic happens. I split it up into different sections because I know what each section does for my audience. And I tell it specifically, this is my vision. This is how I want you to think about it. Now I'll do the work, right? <laughs> and remember to say thank you, right? And then you will also be able to see that the results are very different. When you use a generic prompt, you will see that a lot of the copy and content is very chunky. They tend to have like a same structure and flow, and it does not really convert. Whereas this is V1 of a more, I would say, a level two prompt, right? And then you can see that it has the hero section, our clients, why us, key benefits, and so on and so forth. So even just prompting well will get you really, really good results. Um, trust me on that. I have spent hours testing and testing and testing, so I know what works and what doesn't. So AI is your canvas and you are the artist. So you need to know how to maximize your time on AI to get you the results that you are looking for. Final tools and tips. If you are looking for um, tools to build a website, I highly recommend Framer. Framer is a super cool tool that is great for building landing pages visually but also has copy options. So I would actually combine Framer with ChatGPT in order to craft the perfect landing page. If you're looking for long form blogs, this is a Singapore company called Hypotenuse. I have tested about 12 different AI copywriting tools. This one is really good because it has great structure, great flow, and a great depth of content, and it scores higher on human-like content as well. And of course, you know the image that I showed you of the SK2 social post? This is the tool that I use. It's called Pebbly. It's also by a Singapore founder um, called Alfred. He's a good friend of mine. And what it does is if you have a product, right, you can quickly generate a background image of the product with a text-to-image generator. Of course, there are many other awesome tools out there. But if you want a way to quickly get started, I think you get like 40 photos free on, on his platform. So do check it out. And finally, of course, um, I think Midjourney right now is still one of the best, if not the ultimate AI tools for visuals. I think this is really powerful for realistic images, and it's something that a lot of creators love working with and integrating into their workflows. So with that, of course, AI isn't the end or be all. There are tools and there are limitations to the tools and considerations that we always have. Sometimes AI hallucinates. Um, my friend asked AI to generate a research report for her, and it cited um, six articles that did not exist. So <laughs> that was in the early stages of AI. So remember to, to always check the work and make sure that you know, the output is what you're looking for. Don't just take it as it is. The human element is very important. 
copyright issues, we have had a chat about it. I think this is something we still need to have deep discussions on, but if anything is too similar to another person's work, that is a huge red flag. Think about that when you're using AI. And of course, the quality of work. You will realize that there is a lack of consistency whenever you're trying to get AI to repeat an output. Um, the first output might be great, the hundredth might not be as great, right? So when that happens, what do you do? You think of a different way to prompt, you think of a different solution to the problem. So there are ways to navigate this, and there are ways to use AI to your advantage. And at the end of the day, I just want to say, don't be afraid to play, build, and skill. AI is your tool, it does not have to replace you. In fact, for me, I think I have managed to save 70% of the time I used to take to work on any single project. That is how incredible it has been for me as a writer, and I know it will be for you as well. If you're interested, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I post a lot of free marketing tips and tricks with a lot of super cool resource. And if you want, check out my website. I'm more than happy to um, get back to you on any tips and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Odricia. Uh, we would now like to move on to our next segment, which is the discussion panels with all of our speakers as well as our moderator. May we invite the speakers and the moderator to come up to the stage, please? I hope you all have enjoyed the session so far. And to our audience online, I hope the, this is uh, not only informative, but also come with very practical insights into what we can actually do with uh, AI. Right? So uh, I have some questions that uh, from myself, but I would think there are questions from online as well. And what you can see here is our pigeonhole. So if uh, whether you are an online audience or you are uh, our in-person audience here, you can scan the QR code here and you can start uh, typing in your question. Okay. Okay. While we are waiting for the question to come up, maybe I'll just uh, start with some simple question on my side to uh, start this uh, discussion panel off. Okay. We have looked at many different tools and uh, even ways of using all those tools, right? Um, uh, Audrey has uh, given us uh, some good tips, and uh, obviously Adobe is a very good suite. Now, for the lay person out there, especially the online audience, right? Is there any uh, way, like maybe coming more from the government side of things and so on, that uh, they are they can start off, or uh, the government is uh, helping them in terms of grants or uh, workshop or whatever activities that you have? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, AI Singapore is one place to start. Uh, you visit our website, you can see that uh, we have uh, programs that will help companies, organisations to uh, improve the model that you already have or, or even build uh, models and machine learning pipeline to solve business problems. So, so Mario, for your case, mighty bad if you are looking at optimising some of your workflow or, that, or you just need that additional dedicated machine learning engineer to come and finalize or optimize your workflow, that could be just one option also. But for individuals, uh, for individuals that are looking to learn a little bit more about AI itself, normally the issue isn't about where to learn AI. You can even now learn and have a simple primer to AI just on YouTube. It's just that there are too many information out there. And if time is precious, all that. What we do is we actually assemble uh, curated learning pathways uh, in AI Singapore. We call it Learn AI or it learn at AISingapore.org. You can see a series of uh, short courses. Some are developed by us. Some we actually collaborate with uh, some of our tech partners also. Love to follow up with Adobe to see whether is there any short courses too. Now, but what is very important these days is we find is 
just understand enough about what is AI. But very importantly, and probably for very useful right now, is how do you actually gain mastery of the AI tools? Like some of the tips and tricks from Audrey is extremely helpful, all that. So we we actually develop uh, for the educators like chat GPT prompt guides with educator. And that wasn't done by us alone. We work with MOE schools teachers to actually co-develop that too. So naturally, it's very much of an ecosystem collaboration right now. Um, content, they're very specific to understanding AI, but more importantly now is the gaining the masteries of all the tools that is coming out out there. Yeah. Thanks, Ning Ning. So uh, maybe from Adobe side as well, right? The, obviously, the entire suite, you have spent a lot of effort to create all the features, the wonderful things we can do with AI. But if a layperson wants to try out some of these things today, are they able to do so? Um, absolutely. I think, uh, like I mentioned, our generated AI is available in a lot of different ways, right? including the simplest way, which is just to go to a website, type in something in the prompt and, and produce something. Uh, but other than that, you know, all the different tools we have, AI is starting to pop up in, in different ways in the tools. right? And we're also starting to um, think about different types of tools for maybe people who are not professional designers, for example. Yeah, so absolutely lots of different pathways that you can take. Right, I think the uh, questions online has uh, come in, right? Okay, uh, there are people who are looking to be hired, I think, from our students. Uh, we'll keep that question for later. Now, uh, one of the questions that I've seen even from our pre-registration is like, what kind of skills or AI skill do I need, right, in the new workplace where people are using AI? Yeah, then maybe I'll start with Mario. What do you think? How, how would you qualify or a new hire? Uh, first of all, we are, we are hiring. <laughs> um, but in terms of AI skills, uh, for what we do, uh, it's very, very technical and it's very specific for game development. So, of course, you know, familiarizing yourself with uh, the more generic tools, I wouldn't say generic, but more accessible tools out there like uh, ChatGPT that was mentioned, DALI, um, I think Sora is going to come out soon uh, for consumer use. You know, very, very exciting. Just be, be up to date with the news. You know, be, be in the know of what's coming up, what's cool out there. Twitter is a great space for you to find out a lot of this information. You know, and so that when you, we do onboard you, in, in the event that we onboard you, you already know what are the available tools out there for you to learn and, and pick up. Can I add on to Mario? Sure. Um, in working along AI Singapore in my other professional life, when ever st especially students coming to me, you you your advantage is time. You have time to do a lot of things. And one of the things that you will want to do is to create your own portfolio of the things that you have done. So if you are experimenting with Gen AI tools or that, at least preserve what you have experimented on in some other platforms or whichever, create a portfolio, which when you go for a job interview, what impressed me the most is the person showing me what he or she has done rather than just reading off their academic achievement, you see. So, so especially for, for, for diplomas and degree in creative space, you are, you are required to generate a portfolio anyway, you see. So, so continue to do that. For those in the non-creative space itself, uh, especially if you're dabbling in coding, right, just go and tackle problems that you think needs to be tackled, but at least preserve that experience, be able to show it to me uh, when I'm hiring you to show that you have demonstrated proficiency in certain things. So please, our year two students who are just starting your portfolio development, that's a very good tip, right? And uh, I think the year threes are learning how important the portfolio is now, right? Um, maybe also for Audrey, right? For our students, you have shared some tips. Is there anything else that you think they should be learning? Yes, so I'm going to say something that might be a bit strange coming from me, but I would say that for an aspiring copywriter, they shouldn't use AI because you need to first master the foundations of copywriting as with any other skill set. So if you're able to tell what makes a good ad good, what makes a good headline great, then when you use AI, you're supercharging everything. But if you don't write, 
then you'll just be creating content without the knowledge of what is good and what is not. So even getting your foundations right is very important um, before using AI. So AI is integral, but even before that, you need to also have a specific skill set. I think that's how it becomes super valuable to your employers. Um, I, I, I don't want to add on to that sure. because I did mention that uh, in my segment earlier. Um, fundamentals, you know, uh, basically that's the building blocks of what defines you as a professional of that field, right? You do need to learn the fundamentals so that you can be able to distinguish what's good and what's not, and how do you ev how do you even make it better through AI? Yeah, without if you if you're just a layman and you're just using AI, yes, you can get decent outcomes, but imagine the increase in quality that you can achieve just by being a little more knowledgeable in the field. I, I think that's something that's really really important. I think that cannot be truer if you all came across this article a while ago about a lawyer who just used ChatGPT and didn't bother to check his sources and got a good reprimand for the judges immediately, right? So fundamental is still important as a human being. Uh, okay, let me see what other question. Something more specific for Mighty Bear. Would you say that there are certain laws of creative control due to the use of AI? Ah, this is actually a really good question. So, um, I think the way that we are using AI uh, is quite different. For example, uh, in comparison to maybe Audrey over here, right, uh, who may or may not have as much uh, technical requirements in the type of output that she's looking for. But um, in terms of creative control, I think through the use of AI, we have even greater control because that's when we start training our own data sets and not just relying on data sets uh, that's available in the public domain. And that was how we were able to achieve um, the likeness of our characters, um, very specific nuances that we were looking for in, the, uh, in our characters, in our assets. So I, I would say not at all. In fact, with the use of AI, it's helped us expand a lot more in terms of creative control, where we can go big, you know, and just spread the net as far as possible. Then, at a later stage, really hone down on something that we think, yeah, this is something that has potential. Then just keep going down that rabbit hole until we find something that really, really works for Mighty Action Heroes. Thanks, Mario. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that because that's something that we've thought about at, at Adobe too, given that a lot of creatives use our software. And that's why I've said that um, where generative AI pops up in the interfaces is, is very important because if you have it in many places, then it becomes part of your workflow. And like uh, Mario says, you then get actually get more creative control because then you don't spend so, so much time doing a lot of the mundane things that you might otherwise have spent time doing. Thanks, Ming Fai. Now, Mario mentioned earlier that uh, Sora, now for those of us who don't know what is Sora, uh, some of our online audience, is the latest text to video generation tool from OpenAI, right? I think all the panelists here is very well aware of that. Now, in the light of uh, Sora coming in, even though it's not publicly available yet, how does Adobe see this, especially like you have your own suite of your Premiere tools, After Effects, and so on? Um, in, interesting question because my CEO actually answered that question exactly on, on CNBC, I think, last week or a few days ago. Um, and he was asked exactly the same question. Right? So I'm more or less going to repeat his answer, uh, which is that, first of all, um, we look at AI as data, models, and interfaces. Right. So, if you talk about models, um, yes, we have our own video model that we've been working on for some time, and when we think it's good enough, we will release it. Uh, but more than that, I think uh, just like what we've, what we've done with other types of models, um, what you do with that output is also important, right? Like, you, if you want output a video, then you output a video. But I'm sure the for professional work, um, the creator will want to do more with, 
with that video rather than just outputting a short video. There will be other parts of the workflow that you need to use it on, right? And that's where our tools come in. Right. Thanks, Ming-Fai. Uh, Audrey, would you imagine in the very near future, even for branding and so on, that I think you have definitely used like Mid Journey and so on. What about video? I think there is huge potential in ideating at scale. So the fun part is that now I can go to a graphic designer or a video designer right, and say like, hey, I have an idea. And then we can get it out in two days. So, and it's not the polished quality, right? But you get the idea done so quickly, that the concept, right? And if your clients can see the concept and if you can get it sold, then you can actually get it done um, in a much faster ability. So I think it's the ability to uh, have it as a co-pilot and really work with it to ideate while still having that human element of storytelling, you know, your journeys, what makes any story special is a lot of the human emotions and our lived experiences. So it will help us to get to our final output faster and even, I would say, become more creative. Thank you, Audrey. Maybe for Singming as well, uh, I think we have been talking to a broad spectrum of people in Singapore, right? Uh, have you spoken to your colleagues or even like our filmmakers, local filmmakers? We have some pretty famous ones. Uh, do they know about this AI technology and what is their feel on it? The answer is actually no. Uh, what we do is we collaborate with ecosystem like the police, uh, media corp, etc. So there is definitely both uh, push and pull. There are people asking for information and also people just, just uh, or, or organization just looking at ways which they can improve themselves to. For example, if, if we talk about all this new advancement, or that actually Mediacorp worked with us on a, a deep fake uh, grand challenge. Because one aspect that uh, we haven't really touched on is once you start generating all these videos or that, uh, it becomes quite difficult to discern what's real or not, especially when you, if you are generating uh, human content, you see. So that that is of something that comes with the AI ethics part of it. Yeah. yeah. And since we're on the topic of ethics, right? Maybe we scroll down. I think there might be some question related to that. Or scroll scroll up. Yeah. Oops. Okay, uh, some more? Is there any more? Okay, maybe this is a interesting part. Uh, if you can go a little bit up. Okay, uh, yeah. What are the ethical consideration and potential bias, right? That uh, AI powered creative tools may introduce yeah, I think I attended uh, recently on Monday uh, Adobe workshop as well, and I think there was something that Adobe is doing with regards to like I asked the question: if my student use a uh, generative AI to do a piece of artwork, how do I know whether it's his work or is generated by AI? Well, I think that that relates more to content authenticity because um, one of the things we did is we we worked with other companies, media companies, technology companies to found this, uh, this organization called Content Authentic Authenticity Initiative, right? And the idea behind that is that um, we should be able to attach metadata to a piece of content that gives a history of what was done to that content, right? Who edited it and what tools what was it edit edited using? Yeah, so that, that is part of the Content Authenticity Initiative. And this is uh, built into all the Adobe tools at the moment? Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a great step ahead, right? Maybe also for uh, Mario on your side, you have mentioned that you have not used any of the external tools and you have solely trained on your own uh, content and so on, right? Uh, obviously, we know ChatGPT trains on like millions and millions of things, but when you just train with your own limited data sets, is there any... Uh, limitation or whatever that you encounter? So, 
I, I think that's a very good question. Um, when when I say we generate content based on our data sets, um, we still need stable diffusion. And stable diffusion is trained on uh, public domain uh, data sets, right? But imagine if uh, earlier I showed uh, an image of uh, 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 with variations of a Jeep. So if I were to only use in-house trained data sets, the data set wouldn't know what a Jeep is. Then I would need to create a data set just to let it learn what a Jeep is. So that is where um, um, using stable diffusion and, and public domain data sets can be useful, but you do need to input it, uh, input uh, your customized um, data sets so that whatever comes out is based on the style, based on the, the visuals that has been built upon by our own team. Yeah, so it's, it's, I would say it's still in a pretty gray area. People can still say, oh, you know, you use stable diffusion, you know, that means you are still tapping on, on you know, potentially unethical means. But at the same time, we stand, uh, we, we are very firm in our stance in a sense where we do have to train everything by our own. And the only input, the, the only part that we use stable diffusion is within the input so that it understands the text that we put in there. Let me just add on to that. Yeah. So I was mentioning about all this new evolved uh, conversation about what is IP, right? This fun fact. Um, t last year, there was actually a international design competition and it turns out that the person who won uh, was using stable diffusion. What? He defended his, his win accordingly when people were asking and I actually stand with him. 6,000 over prom was required for him to produce that result. These days, on average, I, I hear you, most of the time after the third prom, I do like start all over again. 6,000 over prom. And one of the content legal I spoke with when we were doing a similar talk in Singapore Design Week, right, was saying that the, the whole premise about what is IP is actually the amount of human agency inside. So even if you are using a tool like Stable Diffusion or that, and people are saying you are just using Stable Diffusion, the amount of human agency that is required to produce this right, can rightfully constitute as IP content itself. So all this conversation about creative control, etc. End of the day, I totally agree with, with the speakers here. At the end of the day, it's just a tool for you to exercise your creativity even more. And laws will... Uh, I myself will predict that laws will eventually evolve to recognize that the amount of prompt design that you're using in generative AI tool as rightful inputs into what classify as IP content. And that would probably just herald a new, new change on how we view what is original content work. Okay. Uh we know recently, like uh, in in US, in the uh, EU, they have uh, lawsuits on AI, especially IP, and and so on. And some rulings have been made, right? Uh, in your opinion, uh, how do you think Singapore is likely to tackle this piece? Okay. Um, well, you have the PDPCs, etc. That Singapore legal side of things. You can find in copyright law two four four two four five it already specifically governed that there is uh, already legal use of digital content when it comes to training computational model. So when you read between all this, it means it is legally acceptable, but again, there is more towards the fact of what constitute original works. Uh. But right now, using public content, online content to train AI models or computational models is already embedded in 244245 already. Maybe on a more personal level, right? Uh, for all the guesses here, uh, do you think one day you would support if someone created a piece of work from AI and you said that it can be copyrighted to that person as something that's created by him or her? Maybe starting with Mario first. Why not? <laughs> I mean, as an artist, right? Um, I've, I've been 15 years in the industry. A lot of what I do is based on other people's work. 
I get inspired by, by people's work. I would say a lot of what I do as an artist is, yes, while it's original, I do have an input in it, but I am also inspired based on what other people have done. And this is what a lot of students do also, right? You look at a cool game, you look at a cool artwork, and you say, oh, I'm going to grow up and become like this. Then you start copying that person's work by hand. Of course, now it's going to be a lot easier to, to create that piece of artwork, you know, through prompts or through uh, image to image kind of uh, tools out there. But if you put in the, the due diligence to, to create your own data sets, again, to, to do all that training just for you to get that final output, why not? Thanks. What about Audrey? I think copywriting is interesting, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, you can't really say that this looks exactly like this unless they read the same. And you can, there's so much nuance to it, style of writing, tone of voice, what you include, the content itself. So I think it would be harder to define if someone has taken a piece of work and turned it into another piece of content. But for myself, what I practice is that I build my own workflows with my client's information and my knowledge, which then helps me to keep things on track um, because that is how I would already have done things even without AI. So for me, it's more of like a method of doing things and a system that I have applied for my own work processes that, has, um, that is my like guiding principle. Ming Fai? Um, I think... Right now, from the state of the technology that we see, there's still a lot of human like, ingenuity, creativity, and, and control that has to go into um, that creation of the work, right? So I think we can support um, in that respect, considering that that work came from a person, right? Like what Audrey described, her work process of how she comes about with something. But there are also things that we cannot see in the future, right? What if one day in the future, uh, generative AI becomes so powerful that you can tell a machine, um, generate a three-hour movie starring famous actress A and famous actor B that's good enough to win two acting awards at the Oscars next year. Will you accept that that work was actually the creation of the person who gave the prompt? Right? Like what Seng Ming said, it depends on how much effort went into that prompt? So how much effort went into the prompt that I just gave? So if the person typed like a 6,000, <laughs> then it will be more acceptable. Yeah. Any personal view from Sing Ming? Okay. Now, let, let's see. Do we have any more questions on the... Okay. Maybe we can address the four votes, that one. The, what kind of AI skills? Uh, yeah. okay. Do you need to increase your attractiveness? Sure. Your employee is, is looking at how best you can get to the organization, how best you can solve problem, or how deep you have read the organization that you came with a proposal to, to say that I can do things differently. Not everything needs to be AI at the end of the day. I mean, Gen AI is an extremely versatile tool, but it doesn't mean that all business problems are solved with AI, you see. To, to me, your attitude, what you have done, I spoke about the portfolio thing to show that what, what you have already done, how deep you know the industry and what you think the employee is facing uh, is more important. So it's, you need to go a bit deeper when, when it comes to actually this question. For, I think for me, it's very simple, right? Know when to pivot know how to leverage it to your advantage because there will be a hundred new tools tomorrow and a hundred new tools the day after. What do you do, right? But if you can master one or two tools and use it to your advantage and show your employers, this is how I'm streamlining my process, I'm very sure they will be impressed. So um, don't be afraid of uh, testing new things, but also don't be overwhelmed by testing new things. It's a very fine balance of knowing how to leverage it and then opening your mind up to new possibilities and then selecting the few that actually aids you in your workflows. Maybe from Adobe perspective, right? Uh, since Adobe is such a big company, we always have your JD in your job description, you need three years of experience, all those things. Do you foresee in the near future that AI skills or AI literacy will be one of the requirements for applying for a job? It depends on what kind of job is 
It is, first of all, right? Um, let's confine it to, let's say, it's, it's, it's a creative job, right? A creative worker. I think, yes, there's definitely an advantage in saying you have experience working with some of the most common tools in the market, right? And, and as Singming has said, show your portfolio. But um, as a worker, you're much more than that, than just using a tool. You, I can hire you, I can let you go through a course for one week just to learn how to use the tool, but it's all the things on top of that. Do you have a vision? Do you have a strategy? Uh, do you understand what project you're working on and what's the best thing you can offer a client, right? So, and I, I think I covered some of this in my presentation, some of the skills that employers are looking for, creativity, communication, the ability to work and collaborate with other people. Um, for me, I, I think it's really important to at least understand why you're using AI in the first place. So, at the very least, get yourself familiarized with ChatGPT. You know, it's the most accessible tool out there uh, as of now. Um, but at the same time, know enough so that your potential uh, employer can have a deeper conversation with you, right? How do you use it? Why do you use it? What kind of outcomes have you um, have you achieved uh, through the use of AI? And also, you know, even to the to something deeper, like if you were to do it by hand versus if you use AI for that specific task, like what would you say were the pros and cons? If I can have that kind of uh, conversation with a prospective employee, I'll be very very happy, you know. Um, of course, there are also a lot of other tools out there, not just ChatGPT. Um, again, in in my field, there's a lot more technical tools out there available. If you're into creating illustrations, what's the best tool out there to create illustrations? If you're into more realistic photography, right? Like, what's the best tool? Or you know, can you list at least three tools? Yeah, you don't need to know how to use it 100%, but at least you are aware of them and you have at least tried maybe like a trial version of it. Like that would be really, really good. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, I think we have uh, already overrun a little bit. So maybe just to wrap up and one last question. Uh, we have lecturers here on the floor and so on, right? Maybe what do you think we can do on our side to help uh, promote this AI in what kind of way so that the, and the students graduate, they will be ready? Let me. <laughs> uh, what can we do? Uh, we, we, AI Singapore is very collaborating with, with RP. So I think deepening, we will continue to be a very good diffuser of what we are learning from our other programs down to you so that you can get your student to be more uh, resume ready, job ready, career ready. I think that's uh, one of the best things that we can help our students on. Yeah. Thank you. Audrey? My advice for both lecturers and students is very simple, to use AI daily. That's how my mom got started. You use it like legit just 10 minutes a day, right? You'll start understanding the nuance. you start thinking of creative ways to use it. you start figuring out, okay, I can use it in this way, that way. So the creative way of thinking about AI is what you will be able to master if you're using it on a regular basis and if you're familiar with it. So use it daily, whether you're a lecturer or not. Um, I think that's the best way to learn and grow and then exchange the insights and that's how you supercharge everything. So once someone learns something, they teach it to me. Now I know how to automate my sales process with AI. Then I can sprint. And then I teach them my copywriting skills. And then they can sprint. So that's the kind of knowledge exchange that I think we can have. Thanks, Audrey. Ming Fai? Yeah, definitely experiential learning, getting everyone, uh, students, uh, and definitely lecturers yourselves to experience using these tools. Don't use them in isolation. Use them as part of the process, as part of a workflow. Use multiple tools as part of a workflow, um, because that's how it's used in the real world, right? Um, so expose yourselves to that, but also be prepared for um, learning how to learn, because all this will change again in two years' time. Um, for me, as a former educator, I think 
the most important thing is to have constructive conversations with with the students. Um, just through the news, we see a lot of noise. We see a lot of negativity about how people have used AI mal maliciously and how people have used AI to hurt other people. I think the conversations that needs to be had with students are how can we use it constructively? Why would we want to use this for the good of whoever we are using this for? Um, and what are some of the ethics that we can take in real life and applying it into uh, the use of AI? AI is just a tool, just like a lot of other inventions that we've seen in the world before, like a knife, for example, right? It can use to do really good stuff or it can use to do not so good stuff. How students, you know, at an early younger age choose to use this tool will depend on the lecturers, on the educators a lot, on how they can use it well. Thanks, thanks for all our panelists. And just to wrap up, I think to borrow what Zeng Ming has uh, shared with us earlier, we are not going to compete with AI. AI is not going to replace us, but we are likely to be competing with another person that's going to use AI. So I think it uh, beckoned all of us to really go into AI and learn more about it. So again, thanks Zeng Ming and uh, Audrey and uh, Ming Fai and Mario. Thanks for your time today. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a small slice of time, the last five minutes. Okay. Now, for those of you that are keen to learn more about AI, we do have some AI courses here in Republic Poly. Uh, this is one of them, Create Stunning Images. The QR code is there. So for all of those who have registered online and so on, we'll be sending this information to your email as well. And uh, this uh, starts on 27th of June, so there's a few months of time for you to consider and prepare for yourself. Right. The next one, we have AI-powered animation. Another short course running on the 21st June. And again, the QR code is here. So these are both very AI focused. So we are going to specifically talk about the AI tools, how we can use them for images, for animation, and so on. Right? And then we have two other specialist diploma. One, the specialist diploma in user experience and infocom technology, where we have infused some of this uh, AI component into some of our curriculum and updated them. Right? So uh, the QR code is there. This is a longer version, a specialist diploma, so the duration is about 12 months. Right? Uh, next slide. Okay, so there are some of the things that we do. For example, we'll uh, go and use a bit of AI when you do your design research, for example, how you can use AI for design research and even for information architecture and interaction design, right? Like ChatGPT V now, V uh, 4V, you can actually uh, upload an image and ask it about what the image is and so on. And you can even use it to give you some basic idea about the UI layout and stuff like that, right? Okay, there's a link. All right, and the next one is a specialist diploma in immersive ad tech design for learning. So this one, we are also teaching not only the ad tech that's already available now, but also AI, because AI is going to be very useful for education as well. So it's again a 12-month course. Schedule is about three weekday evenings. All right, next. And these are some of the things that we'll be doing. So definitely for 2D, 3D uh, asset creation, uh, and even in terms of the, some of the games, gamification, visual design, you'll probably see some of the AI tools and uh, processes being introduced, right? Okay, against the AI tool. 